and those who have had the chance to perform a meta-analysis, I would appreciate your comments as we go along in my presentation. I'd like to define what it is, uh, where and how does it fit into what we call the journey of research from bed, from, from, from bench to bedside. Uh, and then I'll cover various different uh, specific terms used in meta-analysis. So, first of all, we have reviews or editorials or commentaries. These uh, types of published articles tend to be um, tend to represent the opinion of the writer. They may be backed by some references, but these also tend to be the references that back the opinion of the writer or the author. And uh, the idea is to get away from personal opinion and present all the information that is out there about a scientific question that we want to address through a systematic review. And uh, this is where all relevant studies will be included in a systematic review paper. So how now we can see that there is a universe of reviews of which some of the papers can be classified as systematic reviews. And among these systematic reviews, there is a subset that will use meta-analysis. Please be mindful that there might be meta-analyses used outside of a systematic review. In this case, the meta-analysis will suffer the same objections that we apply to reviews of opinion articles and commentaries uh, in that they do not follow a systematic approach to collation of uh, data. Thus, a meta-analysis without a systematic search to capture all the data, um, in my opinion, will not represent the truth about the question that is being addressed in the meta-analysis. Now, this is uh, a representation of the journey in science from laboratory to having health impact. This can also be called translation. In this journey, we have steps forward, but at every so often we have to step back, look at what we are doing before we can step forward again. And here we come across terminology such as clinical efficacy. This precedes clinical effectiveness. And this phase of translation is called T2 translation. The T1 before it involves laboratory, cellular, or animal research. The clinical effectiveness evidence is then uh, followed by evidence synthesis. This is where meta-analysis comes in. This is T3 translation. And subsequently, the meta-analysis and other evidence synthesis techniques are deployed to create guidelines. And this is the journey of research translation. In this journey, the clinical efficacy studies are based on smaller studies, which have around 100 or less subjects. Clinical effectiveness studies are multi-center studies, frequently have many centers, not just in one country, even in many countries and over several continents. And these effectiveness data are synthesized through systematic reviews and meta-analysis. I'd just like to take a small break here and ask if colleagues have any questions or comments about what I've said so far. If any of the attending, uh, if any of the participant has any question, they can write it in the chat box as well as in the Q&A. 
Okay. So look, while you're writing your question in the chat or QA, I'll elaborate a little bit more on this. Here we have the same journey. The feasibility studies, they can precede multi-center studies, as I explained earlier. And these early studies can be put together in systematic reviews and meta-analysis to learn about how to do these studies better. And then also to learn about how to do the multi-center studies based on prior knowledge uh, in a way that they will be definitive and inform what needs to be done. And then frequently these multi-center studies have to be repeated. They need to be informed by systematic reviews. And ultimately all of this is put together into guidelines for having um, an impact on clinical practice and policy. I note that uh, a question has come from Hamza Khan. He asks, are meta-analyses subjective or more objective? Can they only be done by experts? So first I'd like to ask you to think about what is an expert? Um, and then while you are thinking about that, Muhammad Arish has asked a question, what is the difference between systematic review and meta-analysis? So I'm gonna cover these questions about meta-analysis, subjectivity, objectivity, um, and the difference between review and meta-analysis in just a moment. Uh, but may I ask anybody to comment who, who you think can be classified as an expert? Uh, Bash, uh, Benish asks, can a second year medical student conduct a meta-analysis? Yes, definitely they can conduct a meta-analysis. Um, in fact, you don't even have to be a medic to conduct a meta-analysis. The reality is that majority of the meta-analysis conducted and published are not carried out by medics. They are carried out by people who are trained in epidemiology and other related subjects. Uh, Hamza says that an expert in the field could be a doctor with a PhD. Well, I can confirm to you that the majority of the people with the PhD do not achieve an expert status. Expert is one who has knowledge on statistical tests. Well, you could be an expert without knowledge on statistical tests. You could be an expert cardiac surgeon without any knowledge of statistical testing. If you have performed thousands of cardiac bypass operations, you can easily be classified as an expert. Person who has a deep understanding of a subject is an expert. Another definition provided by Nimra. Hafsa says that an expert can be someone who has command over a respective skill. Okay, well, we're talking about knowledge and skill, well identified. Uh, Delhi asks a question about meta-analysis and audit. I'll cover that in a, in a subsequent uh, comment. But at this moment, I'll just take a pause and I'll give you a definition of an expert as I perceive it, the idea is you cannot be an expert unless you have an equal and opposite expert. Expertise is frequently defined by the holding of a particular opinion. Expertise is usually not defined by the unbiased analysis of literature on a particular topic. So I urge you to forget about expertise and focus on evidence. I, I hope I've made my point clear 
I, I, I also hope that subsequently in the presentation, if you would like to comment on what I have said, uh, then please do come forward and uh, ma make your comment about expertise. I think expertise is something that need to be removed from, taken out of our consideration uh, when we are thinking about evidence-based medicine and uh, meta-analysis and systematic reviews are tools for practicing evidence-based medicine that reject expertise or expert opinion. Okay, at this stage, we move forward. But before we move forward, we go a couple of steps back. Some of you have asked me, what is the difference between systematic review and meta-analysis? So I take you to an earlier slide, this one. Here you see the various steps of performing a systematic review. The first step is ask a question. Second step is conduct a, a literature search according to your question. Then extract the data from the relevant literature. And then put together this literature, this data, in a statistical synthesis, if that is appropriate. And this is called a meta-analysis. And then finally, use the information from the meta-analysis and other form of synthesis that you have carried out concerning the data extracted from the relevant literature. And this may be done in the form of what is called evidence grading. And from this information, it's possible then to generate recommendations for practice. So here I try to highlight that reviews are written by experts. And I already highlighted that expertise should be rejected. Systematic reviews are carried out by people who follow a scientific process to collect literature. And then within that scientific process, if meta-analysis has a role, then that meta-analysis is applied within systematic review. And that is what leads to uh, what we are going to be discussing later on today. So here we have now a study carried out, shown here. The study started in 1998. It's a study that I led. It's a randomized control trial. And it took nearly 10 years for it to be published. So conducting studies where patients are recruited, in this study there were around 500 patients recruited, takes a long time. In the journey of a study, in the journey of this study, a systematic review was conducted in planning the study. Then during the course of the study, another team of people working on the same topic published a systematic review. In this case, also with a meta-analysis. Before the completion of this study, towards the end, an update of the previous systematic review was published. And then at the time of completion of the study, a further systematic review was published. And then finally, after completion and publication of this particular study, an individual patient data meta-analysis was published. So I hope with this explanation, it's clear as to what's the difference between a study, a systematic review, and a meta-analysis. Uh, Hafsa asks a question, what makes meta-analysis at the top of research hierarchy? I will come back to that towards the end of my presentation. So please remind me if I have missed that. And Nimra has asked me about evidence grading, and I'm going to comment on, on that too. Uh, Rana uh, Arsalan asks if anybody who's good at collecting evidence, can they conduct a meta-analysis? Well, so look, if you can collect data from a database and then perform an analysis on it, 
you probably have those skills that are required to conduct a meta-analysis. In meta-analysis, the data does not come from a database. It normally comes from data extracted from a published study. This is called a study, uh, a published study based meta-analysis. Uh, but if the authors of the published study are also prepared to share with you the raw data that they put into an Excel sheet or other database for conducting their own study from which they published a paper, then that individual data or raw data can also be used to perform what is called an individual patient data meta-analysis. Okay, so at this point, we move forward to the next stage of the presentation. Here are the five steps of uh, evidence synthesis. Normally, these steps are conducted by several people in a group working together. Typically, it takes around five people to work 12 months together to produce a publication. This in the future will change with artificial intelligence. And uh, I urge you to think about the future. We are talking about uh, not a century from now. I think we are talking about just a few years from now. We will be using artificial intelligence tools for performing meta-analysis. And the idea would be that few people, just a couple of people, harnessing the power of a computer can run the searches, identify the study, extract the data, and this data can then be put together into a soft statistical software to perform meta-analysis. Why is meta-analysis important? So I urge you to think about meta-analysis as the thing that you see in the figure over here. And I'm going to explain to you this figure uh, in, in, the coming, in, in the coming slides. The, what meta-analysis does is it allows us to inform and change practice. So for example, in Scotland, for all these years since 1993 to 1998, several kilograms of albumin were being used, several hundred kilograms of albumin were being used to treat patients who were critically ill. In the thinking that this is going to improve the outcome of the patients admitted in intensive care unit. Now I can urge you now to think about the value of expertise for all these years, 95 to 98, experts were telling clinicians working in intensive care to give albumin to critically ill people. Meta-analysis showed that giving albumin increased mortality. Can you see what expert opinion was delivering? It was delivering an intervention that caused more people to die. It was after evidence synthesis and meta-analysis that the use of albumin start to reduce and hopefully as a result, less people died in intensive care. Can you now see how dangerous it can be to just rely on expert opinion. Okay, so to conduct a meta-analysis, it's important to understand first how a question is framed because this is what allows us to construct our plan for meta-analysis. Um, in order to understand that question framing is part of clinical practice, I urge you to think about a patient presenting to you in clinic. You've got to make a diagnosis and then you have to give them treatment. Before you can make a diagnosis, you need to have some understanding of etiology and pathogenesis. 
And it is this flow diagram that ultimately leads to improvement of outcome. For each one of these different steps in the flow diagram, there are different types of research, etiologic research, diagnostic, prognostic, and therapeutic research. And for each one of these research types, we can do the research directly with patients, or we can take data from published studies and put them together in a systematic review and conduct a meta-analysis. So I hope here you can see how research and various types of research can be put together in studies from which data can be extracted and a systematic review or meta-analysis conducted. Here we now look at a question concerning therapy. We use uh, this, these various components of a research question. In this example of the cartoon that I show you, you can offer two options to the patient. They can be given a new treatment or an established treatment. The standard treatment in some circumstances can be a placebo. These people who agree to be randomized or allocated to two different options are then followed up to see what their outcome is. And you can see uh, in, in light of the words I have used, the study design that I'm referring to here can be a cohort study or a randomized control trial. I urge you to think about not seeing patients only as participants or subjects of a study, but also seeing them as participants and co-investigators in research. For example, what outcomes are important to them sometimes are better known to patients than to doctors or to researchers. And in fact, in the current day, if you submit a paper to a high ranking journal, you may be asked to explain how did you involve the patients and public in your research? This type of engagement of patient and public need to be presented according to a checklist called GRIP2. And here is an example paper which in fact writes in the method section how patient and public were involved in this trial. So we come back to our research question. We start to talk about the flow diagram of participants uh, being given standard treatment or new treatment, and then they are followed up to know what their outcome is. The study that I've just presented to you is a cohort study. In this, you will note that participants, after being allocated to control or new intervention, are then followed up forward in time until their outcomes are measured, and then an effect size is calculated. Compare this to what I'm about to show you now, you start the study with outcomes known. For example, you take some people <clears throat> who are known to have a particular outcome. For example, they suffered COVID. You compare them to a group of people who did not have COVID by going back in time to see whether they received chloroquine or did not receive chloroquine. In this case, time is going backwards. We start with outcome and measure exposures, and then we use all this information to calculate an effect size. This type of study is called a case control study. The literature has confusion in this terminology, in use of these terminologies. And quite often, cohort studies are called case control studies. And a systematic reviewer, to begin with, has to understand the difference between these two designs before they can go on to do a meta-analysis. 
So the point I'm trying to highlight here is that the meta-analysis is not the first step that, that meta-analysts need to have knowledge about. The first step that meta-analysts need to have knowledge about is framing the question and understanding the study design within the question correctly. It looks like we have a question here. Umar asks, if we let the patient choose whatever they want, then it won't be a blinded study. Well, you are right. In this case, it won't be a blinded study, uh, Umar. But this can be a cohort study. It won't be a randomized controlled trial. It will be a cohort study. So I think you, you've, you've got that point right, Umar. Thank you for bringing that up. We now move on to the next stage in a systematic review. I'm going to skip the step of literature searching. I want to tell you something about data extraction because without data extraction, we cannot move on to perform a meta-analysis. So for data extraction, we need to think about the following. When we extract data from published paper, it's important that at least two people do it independently because if one makes a mistake, the other can pick up that error and a mistake can be corrected. And this, this, this coherence between two data extractors can be measured. And one of the statistics used for this uh, complementarity between data extractors is called Kappa statistic. And apart from extracting data, we also need to extract other characteristics of the studies because these are relevant for understanding the results generated from a meta-analysis. So let, let's take here, for example, a study where 200 people have been allocated to control or new intervention. They will be followed up. It may be that some people will be lost during the course of the study. If you find a study where nobody is lost, maybe you will begin to raise doubts about whether the reporting is complete in such a paper. If these people are then followed up to their outcome, then in the published paper, you will see of the 100, assuming nobody was lost to follow up, and the outcome, let's say, is pregnancy, and the treatment is an intervention related to fertility, uh, then you can see that 10 people became pregnant in the control or standard treatment group. And under intervention, 25 people became pregnant. So it's obvious that more pregnancies are achieved. It is this data which can then be used to calculate an effect size. So we take this data and put it in a two by two table. So the outcome is at the top of this two by two table. The intervention and control are on the left hand side. So you put the number 25 over where it need to be and the total where it need to be and so on. And you get this information. So when you divide 25 by 100, you get 0 0.25. That's the rate or risk in the intervention group. The control group rate or risk is 0 0.1. You convert this information into percentage. You can easily see that 25% became pregnant in the intervention group, 10% in the control group. You divide one by the other and you get 2.5. That's the effect size or relative risk. Odds ratio is another measure of effect using the same data, but using a different calculation. You calculate the odds 
of the outcome in the intervention group. This is 25 divided by the number who are not pregnant. It is not 25 divided by the total, like in the calculation of risk. So you get the odds 0 0.3, 3 and 0 0.11 in the control group. You divide one by the other and you get odds ratio. Any questions so far? Okay, so do I make the assumption that it's okay for me now to proceed? Yes, sir. There are no questions so far. You can proceed. Okay. I'm just noticing, uh, okay, Nimra and Hamza have confirmed that uh, it, it's all gone well. So the effect size, once calculated, shows a result that is true for the study sample. If the result is true for the study sample, could it also be true for the population? This is called generalizability. So when we talk about effectiveness, we are normally talking about studies that have produced results that can be generalized outside the study sample. When we are talking about efficacy, we normally do not have the confidence about effectiveness. Okay, and Nimra is asking me to repeat the last slide. I, I'll go back. This is the one you're talking about, Nimra, right? Is there any question about this slide? Can you uh, can you just ask me this question in another way? You ask me, what is the correlation between sample size and population? Is that what you are asking, Nimra? What is the question? Yeah, uh, please look. What you have just asked me may take me six sessions over six weeks to explain. Uh, we now have only about 10 or 15 minutes left in this presentation. Uh, Nimra, I'd urge you to have this discussion with me outside the presentation. Hafsa, you're asking about what is effect size. Hafsa, effect size is the thing that we calculated here in this previous slide relative risk 2.5 or odds ratio 3.0 this is the effect size and there was another question about efficacy of contraception in control or experiment well delhi again what what i don't follow your question clearly you mean did i present an example of contraception and its efficacy or do you mean when we talk about contraception we are talking about efficacy or effectiveness these are two different questions and umar you are asking me Which one is more significant between relative risk or odds ratio for a meta-analysis? Umar, man, significance is a measure measured by p-value. So far, I did not say anything about p-value to you guys. So I have not said anything about significance to you. Please don't become confused about significance and effect size. Effect size is simply a measure of the relationship between relationship between the rate of the outcome in the intervention group compared to rate of the outcome in the control group. And when measured by relative risk, in this case, it is 
when measured by odds ratio, it is 3.0. So the effect size depends on the measure used to calculate the effect size. This is a good question. You're asking, Moise, you're asking how many studies there need to be in a meta-analysis? And the answer is there need to be more than one. As soon as we have two studies, we can perform a meta-analysis. And whether it is publishable or not is a, is a question that goes beyond whether meta-analysis is conducted or not. It also depends on whether your question is valuable to the journal. Okay, at this stage, well, we continue to receive questions. Uh, I like a little bit of guidance from uh, the moderators. How should we proceed? We have only about 10 minutes left according to the clock. Uh, uh, Javad, do we have flexibility over time? Because uh, the these questions being asked are critical to understanding the next stages of my slides. Uh, yes, sir. Actually, uh, we planned it in a way that we'll be having a half an hour Q&A session at the end of your session. But right. uh, if you want it to be an uh, interactive session, that's perfectly all right for us. Okay. Uh, th thank you for explaining that. Uh, so I think I'll continue at the pace we are going. I prefer to take questions as they come because without an understanding of the level of knowledge being developed as my presentation proceeds it's difficult for me to know at what level to pitch the presentation so i'd like to address this question here is it necessary to calculate both relative risk and odds ratio hafsa asked this question hafsa as a researcher at the time of planning your systematic review, depending on the nature of your question, you can decide whether you will use relative risk or odds ratio. And I can give you one tip here. If your systematic review will include case control studies, in case control studies, it is not possible to calculate relative risk. So in a systematic review that includes a meta-analysis of case control studies, it will be necessary for you to use odds ratio as a measure of effect. I hope that makes sense. Okay, and then Zishan asked the, asks a question, what is the minimum or maximum size of case study or sample size uh, which we are using as a reference. So uh, Zishan, look man, I cannot tell you what is the right sample size for a particular research question. I can tell you that if I am conducting a randomized control trial in a subject like gynecology. And my idea is to assess effectiveness. I'm not talking about efficacy, I'm talking about effectiveness. And the effect size of the effectiveness that I want to detect is moderate or mild. Then in this case, I will need to do a study of at least 500 people. But Zishan and other colleagues, I can, uh, as you would already know from your own reading, that there aren't that many studies that have 500 people recruited. So for this reason, meta-analysis does the magic. We can take five studies of 100 people recruited each, put them together, and statistically, we can reach the correct sample size which has adequate power inside a meta-analysis. Zishan, does that make sense?
Zishan, if it doesn't make sense, please don't worry. This is a common problem that even very experienced researchers face on a daily basis that you've asked. So I appreciate you raising this question. I guess the short answer is meta-analysis solves the problem of studies of small sample size subject to there being sufficiently good quality studies available. Remember, sample size could be a feature of a good quality study, but a study could, could be of a good quality, even if it does not have a good sample size. And I'll explain this point in a moment. Okay, so um, there is one more question. So, uh, please repeat the difference between effectiveness and efficacy. So I Ikra, thank you for raising this point. I'm just about to touch on this by going back through this slide. In this slide, I showed you that the effect size calculated, depending on the quality of the study, is rep a true reflection of what has been studied in the study sample. You agree with that, right? The effect size, 2.5 that we calculated in the previous slide, is true for the 200 people who took part in the previous study. In this study, the result we obtained, 2.5 relative risk from these 200 people, this value 2.5 calculated from these data is true for the sample. The purpose of doing research is to find out data, to find out results, to discover results that will be true for people outside your study sample. A study carried out in Rawalpindi People in Lahore should be able to use that study for their patients. Well, people outside Pakistan in Spain should also be able to use the results of that study carried out in Rawalpindi. This feature of a study where the effect size can be taken outside the study sample and applied to other populations this is called generalizability. A study that is large, in this case, we will have greater confidence that the effect size can be applied to people outside the study sample. A study that is carried out in Rawalpindi and Lahore in two centers. In this case, we will be more confident that the effect size obtained can be applied to people in Karachi. You can see now that a large study carried out in multiple centers increases the possibility that the result can be used for people outside the sample. If a study has features that permit the use of the result outside the study sample, this type of a study is called effectiveness study. A small study carried out in a single center or within a single clinic in a center, not even in multiple clinics in the same center, this type of a study, the result cannot really be applied to outside the study sample. This type of a result is called efficacy result. So colleagues who asked about the difference between efficacy and effectiveness, is the difference clearer to you now? Okay, so Ikra says, yes, it's clear. Uh, you got it. Thank you for your response. Nimra, you also are clearer. And a colleague has also asked a question about confidence interval. It's a very good timing to ask that question, Hafsa. I will come 
come to it in just one second. So just to recap, an effectiveness study will have wider populations, will have less strict eligibility criteria, will have health outcomes that are relevant to the public. It will have be of long duration. It will have assessed adverse effects. It will perform intention returns. All of these features help to create an effectiveness result. Now, <clears throat> you have carried out your search and you have several studies available. From those studies, you will read the text and the tables and you will need to extract these data. How many people were in the treatment group? How many were in the control group? And how many had that outcome? From these data, you will be able to calculate the relative risk like we did a couple of slides ago. So here we have seven or eight studies, the data extracted for all those studies. The data are presented as relative risk and confidence interval. So I appreciate the colleague who asked the question about confidence interval. I'll come back to explain to you in a second. In this case, these data and relative risks are presented according to year of publication. This type of a diagram shows that the relative risk point estimate is shown by a dot. So for example, five is shown over here with a dot. And 0 0.2 is shown over here with a dot. The scale here moves from zero at one end to infinity on the other end. So you can see that the dot in this diagram represents the point estimate of effect. The same thing that we calculated a few slides ago. The confidence interval is the possibility of the range of results or effects possible in the sample size in this study. And this confidence interval is represented by a line across this dot. You can see that the line is related to the sample size. Here, a study of nearly 200 people, the line across the dot is smaller, whereas a study with only 30 or so people, you can see here, this line across the dot is wider. And a study with around 90 people is intermediate here, you can see in between. So I hope you can see that the relationship between sample size and confidence interval over here So an anonymous attendee has asked me, relative risk or odds ratio tell us what in layman terminology? If this number is five, in this study by Ann Milk, it means that the chance of being pregnant under the new treatment compared to standard treatment is five times higher. That is what relative risk means. So the number five shows that the probability of there being the outcome under treatment compared to control is five times higher. Okay, so Hafsa asked, does a greater sample size lead to greater confidence interval? So Hafsa, typically, a greater sample size lead to smaller confidence interval. But your point is a good point. 
if you look at this study with 30 or so observations, the confidence interval is quite large. It is in fact larger than another study of 20 people, which is this one. So you can see that the confidence interval isn't just a function of total sample size. It is also related to the number of outcomes in the total sample. So the, the sample size, when outcomes are few, could lead to a large confidence interval. The rule of thumb is the larger the study, the short, smaller the confidence interval, but this is subject to there being sufficient outcomes. I hope that makes sense. Hafsa, is that clear? Okay, Hafsa, th th thank you for your response. I appreciate you responding immediately. Um, uh, we now move forward. We will return to these points again. Now look in this diagram above. The studies were ordered according to year of publication. You can reorder the studies also according to other features. Here, a reordering has been carried out according to study quality. So the highest study quality is ranked at the top. And the lowest study quality is ranked at the bottom. All of these are randomized controlled trials. So let me just summarize so far what we have learned. Before I go forward, we have learned number one, data need to be extracted concerning totals and those with outcomes from published papers and put into a two by two table. From the two by two table, we can calculate the effect size. In this case, we calculate relative risk. The relative risk can be presented in a forest plot. And using a, ready, a readily available online uh, calculator, the confidence intervals can also be calculated. And this data can also be put into a forest plot. And the studies with the data extracted can be ordered according to a particular feature of the studies, for example, according to the year of publication or according to study quality or another feature. 